What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and today we're going to be talking about the best ranged units in each faction in Warhammer 40k. Now, a while ago, I made a video on list building where I talked about the concept of the Pentagon of Power, the five pillars that compose every Warhammer 40k army, and the five roles that you'll need to fill in order to build a balanced and effective Warhammer army. And one of those was range DPS, which is the role that we're going to be talking about in each army today. So for this video, we're going to be talking about units that primarily deal damage at long range. That is going to be ranges greater than 24-ish inches, although with some exceptions, and units that use that range damage as their primary contribution to the army. So we're not looking at units that split their damage output between ranged and melee, or also fill a support role. These units are going to be focused specifically on laying down some big old gunshots downrange and blowing stuff up. With those criteria out of the way, settle in, grab yourself a drink, subscribe to the channel, maybe drop one of them likes on the video, I really appreciate it, and let's talk about some gunslingers. We'll start with the Adeptus Sororitas. Typically, you'll see Retributor Squads packing four multi-meltas, which does put them within that 24-inch range band, although you'll often see them brought in Argent Shroud with some abilities to increase their threat range, which can give them a lot more reach than that relatively short 24 inches would normally allow. Firing eight multi-melta shots per unit, plus two or more Cherubs for an additional four multi-melta shots at whatever you want after you go to shoot, and supporting those multi-damage weapons with Miracle Dice to make them highly consistent, as well as effects like Morv involved for full rerolls to hit and wound, makes this unit an absolutely deadly threat on the tabletop. While they don't really deal much damage to smaller, more lightly armored targets or more numerous units, if you put a heavily armored tank or elite infantry in front of them, they'll have no problem ripping them directly off the table. While they usually fall into the Sororitas game plan of trading units with their opponent, Getting those Retributors up in the middle of the table to fire with them, deal significant damage, and then lose them to force the opponent to expose another unit that another Retributor squad or a similar unit can kill. If you ever leave a Retributor squad alive for multiple rounds of shooting, it is supremely painful. Moving on to the Adeptus Custodes, for an army that has melee weapons on basically every single unit in the Codex, the breadth of ranged options for Adeptus Custodes is pretty interesting, and I definitely considered picking a unit like the Caladius Grav Tank in this slot, but I think a more ubiquitously taken unit is going to be the Sagittarum Custodian. These troop options sport basically a heavy bolter with an underslung disintegration beam, all of them at an assault weapon profile, which allows them to supplement the pretty long 36 inch range with an advance roll. While each individual Sagittarum doesn't put out a ton of damage with three two damage shots and potentially an additional three damage shot on top of it with that disintegration beam, Bringing them in units of three and, more importantly, bringing them to fill your troops allotment means that you'll typically have a wide volume of shots out of these guys. It's pretty common for Custodes lists to be bringing nine or twelve Sagittarum Custodians, and that damage output, especially when it's hitting on twos with rerolls from Trajan Valoris, starts to stack up pretty significantly. It certainly helps that they're also filling those important troop slots in your detachments, and being Custodes Infantry are also objectives secured to hold your backline objectives as well. Being a Custodian, they're also T5 of the 2 plus save and a 4 plus invulnerable save as long as you're in faction, which means they're not that easy to kill on the swing back. A unit that is sometimes a lot easier to kill on the swing back is our pick for Adeptus Mechanicus. This is the Scutarii Ranger Squad. Adeptus Mechanicus is a faction blessed with a glut of powerful ranged attackers, but one of the ones that you see in almost every list because of the incredible support that the faction can give to them are the Skatarii Rangers, and specifically Rangers out of a veteran Ranger cohort giving them access to the stratagem to give them plus one to wound. In addition to the Galvanic Volley Fire stratagem as well, Ranger squads can put out a significant amount of shooting at relatively long range, and given how cheap they are and and how numerous can take huge chunks out of even heavy targets if they're brought in 20-man squads. With upgrades like Omnispexes, allowing them to ignore cover, and the massive support both offensively and defensively that Adeptus Mechanicus can pour onto these guys, they can deal significant damage. That's certainly not to say that they're the only arranged option in Adeptus Mechanicus, but they're certainly the most common and one with the most utility. Speaking of common factions, let's talk about Astra Militarum. 
This one was pretty tough because Astro Militarum, while they do have a similar number of ranged options to Adeptus Mechanicus, each individually isn't quite as impressive as they would be in Adeptus Mechanicus. While things like the Manticore or even the Tempestus Scion's Torox Prime, the one nearly ubiquitous option that most Astro Militarum detachments take right now is the Tank Commander. While you normally see these guys equipped with a Demolisher Cannon, giving them only a 24-inch range, their Sponson and Hall-mounted weapons will typically be longer range than that, and you can supplement that with abilities like Spotter Details to increase the range of their weapons, or sub-factions like Talarn, which allows them to move and shoot, effectively increasing their range while keeping the tank out of line of sight behind obscuring terrain. While they're not quite as efficient as they have been in the past, Tank Commanders can still put out some significant damage, especially when upgraded to Tank Aces. And at least in the current version of Astro Militarum, I don't expect that to change anytime soon. Moving on to Grey Knights, this one was a really tough one because while almost every Grey Knight unit has some significant range damage output, all of it is relatively short ranged and none of their units are really dedicated ranged options. While most of the Grey Knight armies you see in the 9th edition Codex will get most of their range damage output out of their Nemesis Dread Knights, you can't really call those ranged attackers. They only have a 24 inch range, they only really supplement that range by being highly aggressive, and most of their damage output comes from their melee attacks anyway. So, for this, I'm actually elected to choose the Venerable Dreadnought. With a 2 plus ballistic skill like all Venerable Dreadnoughts and the ability to mount a missile launcher in addition to a multi melta or a twin last cannon, the Venerable Dreadnought puts out some significant long range damage that's all relatively consistent, especially thanks to that core keyword. In addition, it can be very difficult to kill, being able to cast Armored Resilience on itself, giving it a 2 plus save. While we haven't really seen Dreadnought see too much play in Grey Knight's army so far, and the 9th edition Grey Knight's Codex has been very much a combined arms codex that usually engages at relatively short range and tries to get as into melee as much as possible. If you are looking for some long range damage output at that 36 inch plus range band, the Venerable Dreadnought is here for you. Now let's continue our talk about Dreadnoughts by moving to Space Marines. I don't think anyone is going to be surprised at what I choose here, because we're basically becoming the Relic Contemptor Dreadnought channel over here on Tactical Tortoise, with the amount that we talk about Volkite Contemptor Dreadnoughts, but the Relic Contemptor is one of the most efficient range platforms in all of 40k, and certainly in Space Marines. Being able to mount two twin Volkite Culverins for a total of 16 Strength 6 2 damage shots with the potential to deal mortal wounds on wound rolls of 6, in addition to two missile launcher shots, all for the low cost of 150 or 175 points depending on how you kit it out. The Relic Contemptor Dreadnought is super powerful, and it's no surprise that almost every Space Marine list that plays competitively is taking one or more of these guys. Once you start stacking additional buffs on them, especially in sub-factions like Iron Hands, the Relic Contemptor Dreadnought can deal a ridiculous amount of damage for not very many points. We've talked about these guys a lot, and you can look at almost any of my other Space Marine videos if you want to hear me talk about some of the incredible combos you can use with Relic and Tempter Dreadnoughts. So we'll go ahead and move on to the Chaos sub-factions now, starting with Chaos Demons. Now this one was really hard, because Chaos Demons are not really a faction that deals damage at range. Usually they want to throw psychic powers at you or charge you with swords and stuff. My first instinct was actually to pick the Skull Cannon, a weird Cornate Chariot unit that doesn't see much play, but does come with a 48 inch range Strength 8 AP2 D3 damage blast weapon for only 90 points, which is, I mean, it's certainly something. It does come with a 3 plus ballistic skill, which is a little bit hard to find in demons, and ignores cover, which is nice, but for 90 points, the single gun with D6 shots is not exactly what you're looking for. Instead, what I ended up taking, and I actually crunched some numbers to determine which was the more efficient ranged attacker, the answer ended up being the Soul Grinder. Now this thing does have a 4 plus ballistic skill that does degrade pretty quickly, which is unfortunate, but it does have some pretty significant ranged output with 3 shots with a D3 damage Harvester Cannon, as well as D6 shots with a 36 inch range Strength 8 AP2, flat 3 damage, blast phlegm bombardment. It also comes with the upside of being kind of difficult to kill. It is demonic, so it has a 5 plus invulnerable save, and can take Mark of Zinch to make that a 4 plus invulnerable save, or Mark of Nurgle to give it a 5 plus disgustingly resilient damage ignore roll, and with a base of 14 wounds, this guy's actually kind of a tank. The downside is for 175 points and only that 4 plus ballistic skill. While it does out damage the skull cannon point for point, it's still not particularly efficient. The upside of Chaos Demons is that if you're looking to fill a particular role, you can do that easily with another faction in the Super Faction. And let's talk about one of those as we move on to Chaos Space Marines. Now this one is also really hard. I, I think 
maybe the number one pick is the Chaos Contemptor Dreadnought, but we already talked about the Relic Contemptor Dreadnought when we talked about Space Marines, and that was kind of boring, so I don't really want to rehash that. We're also focusing on Codex Chaos Space Marines here, so we're not talking about Death Guard or Thousand Suns. We'll talk about those guys momentarily. Now, honestly, while there's so many good options to choose from here, a lot of them are predicated on either being kind of mixed role, so something like a Corn Lord of Skulls, which typically deals a ridiculous amount of damage, but splits it between ranged and melee attacks. So a unit like Noise Marines, which kind of requires it to get up close and personal personal with its opponent in order to deal its damage doesn't really fit the role that I wanted to talk about. In this case, I've elected to talk about the Havoc Squad, although I certainly think that there's arguments to be made to pick a lot of other units in this role. Like, situationally way better at shooting than regular Space Marines, which doesn't really make sense given how much better regular Space Marines are in melee. You think the guys that basically staple chain swords to their arms would be good at fighting, but nah, they're, they're better at holding guns, I guess. While the standard Space Marine profiles, like Havocs, haven't gotten the glow up that they really deserved in 9th edition as of yet, with the ability to mount four heavy weapons, which could be anything from Laz Cannons to Reaper Chain Cannons for a massive volume of fire, and can move and fire those heavy weapons without penalty. Upgrade them with the Mark of Slanesh, give them Veterans of the Long War for plus one to wound, and then Endless Cacophony to attack with those weapons twice, and a unit of Havocs can deal ridiculous damage for relatively low points cost. Like a lot of Chaos Space Marine units, you do have to dump a lot of CP into making them powerful, but that's basically just a trait of the faction. Now let's move on to some of the other slightly weirder Chaos sub-factions as we talk about the other types of Heretic Astartes bouncing around the Eye of Terror. First up, we have Death Guard. And in this case, we're going to talk about the Plague Burst Crawler. This thing is so good. Stacking two Entropy Cannons, which are basically just Dark Lances, on top of its Indirect Fire Plague Mortar, and having an incredibly tough body with that damage reduction, with Toughness 8 and that damage reduction, and an Invulnerable save, Plague Burst Crawlers have the ability to sit in the back of the table poke at your opponent all game and survive a ridiculous amount of counter battery. With an indirect fire weapon, these things can reach out and touch important enemy units that they're hiding behind line of sight blockers, can kill objective holders that they have in the back of their deployment zone, or, I mean, it's a good enough damage that they can just start plinking wounds off something heavier. With those entropy cannons as well, any heavily armored targets that move into line of sight are going to get rinsed down pretty quickly. It's not uncommon to see three Plague Burst Crawlers in basically every Death Guard list ever made, and that's for good reason. These things are phenomenally tanky fire bases. Now moving on to a little bit of a less straightforward faction, we have Thousand Suns, and for this one, I've actually chosen Scarab Occult Terminators. Now these guys don't really seem like the backbone of a powerful gun line given that they basically only have a standard Terminator loadout with a pretty decent melee output and basically just a Storm Bolter. But the way Thousand Suns use this unit is a little bit more of a battleship than you would expect. With access to abilities like Empiric Guidance to increase the range of their weapons to 30 inches, the Scarab Occult Terminators can actually reach out and touch a lot farther down the table than you might expect. On top of that, a litany of powerful bonuses and stratagems to use on them can skyrocket their damage output through the roof, including Infernal Fusillade to give them an additional attack, Soul Reap to potentially double the number of attacks they make with their Soul Reaper cannons, and the ubiquitous plus one to wound from their Veterans of the Long War equivalent, Wrath of the Wronged. With the ability to take their Hellfire Missile Ranks on top of their Soul Reaper cannons and all of those Inferno Combi Bolters on the unit, once you start delivering all of those buffs onto them, they start dealing some really significant damage. Damage. Their relatively slow speed can be accounted for with powers like Sorcerer's Facade or the Umbralific Crystal Relic to teleport them around the table. While they don't operate like a normal gunline unit, they certainly fulfill the role of reaching out and attacking important opponents' units so that you can't always be safe against the Thousand Suns army. Another unit that's going to reach out and get you is our Picked for Craft World as we move into the Eldari sub-factions. There are a lot of pretty decent shooting units in Craft Worlds, and things like the Night Spinner or Support Weapons platforms were all on the table for this pick. But in the end, I've elected to choose Dark Reapers. With a very solid profile on their standard Reaper launcher attacks, at a 48 inch range with one or two shots for two or three damage, depending on the type of attack you're making, and the ability to upgrade the Reaper Exarch with a Tempest Launcher to give them a powerful indirect fire attack on top of that, Dark Reapers have a very flexible range profile and benefit immensely from a lot of Eldari buffs. 
Debuffs like Doom or Jinx on a unit targeted by Dark Reapers means that unit is typically not long for this world. And using Fire and Fade to get them in a transport or keep them safe behind line of sight blocking train means that Dark Reapers can stay active for the entirety of the game. A good Eldar player using Dark Reapers well is an absolute nightmare to play against because oftentimes you won't be able to get to grips with them until it's too late and they've whittled down your army and they've whittled down your army enough that you're not able to contend with their frontline units. Having that powerful indirect as well, a strength 4 AP2 blast weapon with 2d6 shots is excellent for clearing off objectives or just putting dents into numerous enemy units before the real engagement begins. Now moving on to some other Eldari, we'll talk about Drukhari, and this time we're going to talk about Cabalite Trueborn. This isn't really a unit in and of itself, they're just Cabalites with an extra upgrade which you unlock when you take a Master Archon, but they are certainly one of the most efficient shooting platforms in the game. Coming in with a base 2 plus ballistic scale and not suffering any penalties means that these guys will shoot directly through defenses like dense cover, hard to hit, and won't suffer the move and shoot penalty when firing their heavy weapons, and they'll almost always have one Dark Lance in the unit in addition to two blasters. While the extra splinter rifle armed models in the unit aren't really that exciting, they are a blade of wounds for those heavy weapons, and since the unit's probably going to be in a raider gallivanting around the table and drawing line of sight around weird places, those three heavy weapons are going to be able to deal significant damage. Once you destroy the raider, you haven't even necessarily stopped those heavy weapons from shooting, since they can take the casualties from bailing out of that destroyed transport on their splinter rifle armed comrades, use an emergency disembark to get them back behind line of sight, and continue shooting in future rounds. Cabalite Trueborn are inexpensive and an absolute nightmare to deal with. They don't deal a massive amount of damage, but it is enough damage that's stacked up over the course of the game since they're very difficult to pin down, often makes up for their low points cost many times over. Moving on to Harlequins. This is a really tough one because Harlequins don't really do shooting that much. They really only have one kind of dedicated ranged unit. And I'm certainly not gonna pick that one for the best of anything in the faction because the Void Weaver is very bad. Instead, I've elected to choose the Death Jester for this selection. Now, the base profile of the Death Jester is not that exciting, especially for kind of a dedicated ranged gun platform. With only a 24-inch range and this is kind of weird damage profiles, potentially one shot that might deal mortal wounds or three shots with no AP, these guys seem a little bit lost. But it's once you start dumping upgrades on them that things start to get truly zany. And let me tell you, zaniness is what Harlequins do. Upgraded with the Shigarax Lament Relic, the Death Jester's Shrieker Cannon gets upgraded to AP3 and 36 inch range, making it an actual sniper at that point, instead of just kind of a, a dude with a regular gun. On top of that, using the Harvester of Torment Pivotal Roll, meaning that every time the Death Jester hits with one of its attacks, the hit is tripled, meaning that hitting all three times with its three shuriken attacks inflicts nine hits on the target unit. At Strength 6 AP3, that means on one wound infantry, this guy can deal a ridiculous amount of damage. While he's not that exciting against larger units, and oftentimes you'd rather have Humbling Cruelty on that Death Jester to make Overwatch a little bit less useful for your opponent, the ability to rip eight or nine infantry off the table with every shooting phase definitely makes the Death Jester a force to be reckoned with, at least against units of six or more models. While it's not quite as impressive as a ranged attacker as we have talked about in other units in this list, that's not really Harlequin's jam, and oftentimes they'll be reaching for some of those Dark Reapers out of Craft Worlds if they're looking for something to fill that role. Now let's start to move on to some of the other Xenos races and start with the Tyranid subfactions, or the Forces of the Hive Mind, and the Gene Stealer Cults. While Gene Stealer Cults have a long list of actually relatively efficient vehicle units, for this one I've chosen the Achilles Ridge Runner. Mounting two heavy stubbers on top of a um, heavy mining laser, which is a D3 shot blast weapon with a Laos cannon profile. At only 70 points, maybe 75, depending on how you upgrade them, the Ridge Runners are just a pretty decent gun platform. They're not even that easy to kill, sporting eight wounds with a potential damage ignore roll if you've taken the flare launchers on them, and you can easily buff up their pretty bad four plus ballistic skill with units like the Jackal Alphys or stratagems like Raking Fire. Overcharged Weaponry can give them plus one to wound on their mining lasers, meaning that a unit of three of these firing a significant number of mining laser shots can deal a bunch of damage to a heavily armored target. Ridge Runners aren't the greatest ranged attacker in the game, but they aren't bad and are cool race cars, which definitely scores an extra point in my book. We'll move on to the big daddies of the Gene Stealer cults. We'll talk about Tyranids next. To anyone who's played against Tyranids lately, this answer is going to be pretty self-explanatory. 
It's the Hive Guard. Sporting an indirect fire 36 inch range weapon with a ridiculous profile, two shots at strength 8 AP2 for D3 damage that ignores cover. Turreted Hive Guard are usually hiding behind a ruin somewhere and just vaporizing everything that happens to wander within 36 inches of them. And certainly, once buffs like the Kronos Subfaction ability to reroll their ones to hit, or Symbio Storm to give them exploding sixes, have the capability to explode their dice into some insane turns of damage output. That's not even taking into account that the unit can shoot twice using the single-minded Annihilation Stratagem. Tyranid Hiveguard are kind of a silly unit and are basically required in every Tyranid list. They're essentially single-handedly keeping the faction competitively viable. And while it's kind of a boring playstyle to sit behind a big wall and shoot guns a bunch, it's definitely effective, which is the least you can say about Hiveguard. Now, moving on to the factions that don't really have a super faction, these are the Miscellaneous Xenos. And first off, we have Necrons. Now, I racked my brain for a long time to think about this because I, there's a lot of pretty solid ranged attackers in Necrons, although none of them are particularly good. For a faction with phenomenally advanced technology, Necrons kind of have a dearth of legitimately good ranged options. And the ones that they do have tend to be stapled to powerful melee platforms, which means that they kind of lack a dedicated unit to sit in the back of their deployment zone and shoot a lot. The Doomsday Arc certainly comes to mind as an example of this, but that's not the one I've picked today because I actually found that in addition to the fact that it has to remain stationary in order to get the maximum damage out of its main weapon, it's actually slightly less efficient than the Tesseract arc. While for only a 10 wound vehicle, these guys come in at a hefty 170 to 200 points, depending on how they're loaded out. The Tesseract arc does come packing with a particularly powerful singularity chamber a ranged weapon that has a bunch of different attack settings, all of which good in different situations. The one you're going to be using most often is a heavy D6 variety, firing strength 8 AP3 D6 damage weapons. With the ability to mount two Gauss cannons on top of that for some extra punch at 24 inches, or particle beamers or Tesla cannons if you're looking for a greater volume of attack, the Tesseract Arc has a lot of very relevant attacks. Without the requirement to stand still to fully power up its gun, the Tesseract Arc can be much more mobile than the Doomsday Arc, meaning that it can get interesting lines of sight, use that fly keyword to its greatest effect to jump around obscuring terrain, and potentially in an Eternal Conqueror's list, move up aggressively to take your opponent's objective. While these are more utility roles, at the end of the day, the Tesseract Arc is just a more efficient ranged attacker than most of the other options the Necron Codex can take. Moving on to Orcs. This one's a little bit of an interesting discussion because Orcs have really always been kind of a gunline army and in the 9th edition Codex have gotten a bunch of new options to bring that Orc gunline to life. In this case, I think I'm going to choose the Rucka Truck Squeak Buggy. I think probably to no one's surprise, given the amount of coverage that this little unit has gotten in the last couple of weeks, the Rucka Truck Squeak Buggy brings a 2d6 shot indirect fire weapon at a strength 5 AP2 for 2 damage profile. With some additional shots at short range, the kicker is that the squig launchers mounted on the Squeak Buggy are all indirect fire, meaning that there's no hiding from the squigs. They're going to come get you. On top of that, being affected by the speed wah means that a lot of the time that they're shooting, these squig, buggies, these squig buggies are going to be AP3, which is a phenomenal profile to be firing over walls. In addition, the squig buggies buck the trend of orcs typically being very inaccurate, getting plus one to hit on their heavy squig launcher attacks, meaning that they're going to be firing at an effective weapon scale four. That's pretty good for setting up freebooters chains, giving the entire army plus one to hit, and allowing the other components of the orc gun line to become more and more efficient as the squig buggies start converting casualties. With a laundry list of additional special rules and just the effect of having a T6 nine wound body with ramshackle for only 90 points, the squig buggy is incredibly efficient and a ranged attacker with a damage output that you can't really shake a squig at. And that'll move us on to the last faction that we're going to be talking about today. This is the Tau Empire. Now these guys are the shooty guys. They got all the guns and they have a bunch of units to talk about when it comes to dealing damage at range. Today, I've elected to choose the Crisis Bodyguard unit over all of their many other ranged options. And even Remora Stealth Drones are all on the table for some really powerful ranged attackers in the Tau army. At the end of the day, the focal point of most Tau builds currently are going to be these big Crisis Bodyguard Death Stars. With the ability to mount multiple missile pods and get the bonuses of sub-faction abilities like Hardened Warheads or Farsight Enclaves, when supported, Crisis Bodyguards can deal a ridiculous amount of damage at range while being very difficult to kill on the swingback. Using upgrades like Iridium Battlesuits and Reactive Countermeasures, 
alongside those savior protocols allowing them to pass wounds onto nearby drone units, making it difficult to actually score wounds on the bodyguards themselves. While being tanky isn't really the criteria we're going for right here, at the end of the day, firing an absolute boatload of pretty powerful missile pod shots with a lot of access to rerolls from those sub-faction abilities and stratagems that we've spoken about, the Crisis Bodyguard unit is a very solid heart to a Tau gunline. And with that, that's it. We've talked about every faction in Warhammer 40k. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. I want to throw a big thanks to everyone who supports the channel over on Patreon and patreon.com slash tactical tortoise. YouTube channel members and Twitch subscribers, all those people are phenomenal for helping me do what I do, making cool YouTube videos about Warhammer 40k. Thanks again for supporting, and remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy wargaming.